introduction by Stephen, I'm kind of humbled. <laughs> I usually have to introduce myself, so that, that's kind of a treat. I can tell you it's been interesting coming to Illinois. We've had, you know, Sherry and I have been around the country over the, over the course of our ministry with uh, the Adventist Church. We spent, we started in Texas and have been in Ohio and North Dakota and Massachusetts, and now we're in Illinois. And there is a distinct difference in every part of the world, or every part of the country where we live. Difference in culture, difference in people. And Illinois is no different from anybody else. They are different. So that's, uh, that's the blessing of individuality. Amen. Illinois Conference has a student body of about 500 students in our schools. That's preschool through to 12th grade. If the North American Division statistics are correct, it appears that less than 25% of our eligible students are in our schools. Now, if you think about this, and you look at the studies that have been done from 30 or 40 years ago of who's in our schools, you will find that usually in a give, any given church, of the people that are of childbearing age, about one-third of those families stick their children in our schools. The fact is, we have less people that are church members that are of childbearing age than we used to. So the, same, the ratio is about the same, it's just that we have a graying population in the church. So when I talk about church or school membership and school enrollment, it's a bigger system problem other than the schools. It's the whole church. It's, the, it's, the whole, it's all of uh, the Christian churches within North America. The other fact I'm going to give you, I'm full of factoids. The other fact I'm going to give you is there was an article written about five or six years ago in the Adventist Review, and it simply stated study of how what's the most effective form of evangelism. And it stated two things. Of all the dollars spent, the most effective uh, form of evangelism were in two areas, education and pathfinders. One, if they were in pathfinders, they stood about a 40% chance of being in the church 10 years after leaving high school. If they were in education, they stood about the same chance of being in the church 10 years out of high school. If you put the two together where they participated with Pathfinders and with uh, the um, uh, Adventist education, there was a 90% chance of them being in our, in our church 10 years after graduating high school. That's pretty profound. It's, it's, very, um, it's very telling of where we're at as a society. If there are any prospective parents, if there are any parents or any church board members or uh, school board members that have not seen the book that I'm holding, Educating for Eternity by uh, George Knight, there's actually a subtitle, A Seventh-day Adventist Philosophy of Education. Please get your hands on one and read it. It is simply the best description of the difference of Adventist education uh, as to any other form. Now, I say this because I know there are many copies that have been handed out to our our, uh, our pastors, our teachers, I, I passed out two or three at our school board meetings, so I know there's some in this church. Feel free to share them. Very good reading, very informative, and uh, in the end, it's a, it, it's a very great description of, of Adventist education. That's it for my public service announcements. So, um, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning 
thankful for the blessings of, of Gurney Church and their school. We ask blessings on my message this morning, that it be worthy of you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In Stephen's eloquent, a little bit closer, there we go. Um, in Stephen's eloquent description of uh, myself and Sherry, there's a few things he didn't say. He probably doesn't know them, but I, you know, I have not been an educator all my life. I've done many things, including a stint in the military. Uh, I am not a military retiree. I got out before I could uh, get a retirement check, but I spent nine or ten years in it, and I was in the Army, and I started out as an engineer, and, with an in- and then I became a um, military intelligence specialist. And I know it's a conflict in terms, right? Uh, <laughs> The, uh, but then after that, I, they uh, decided I needed to be a, a, a U.S. Army drill sergeant, and I was that for a few years. Every one of those jobs, I learned something, but across those jobs, there was one thing that was, that was always taught and always taught to a T, and it was how to use a compass, compass and map reading. And what I have in my hand is a... Uh, in the military, you would call it a linsatic compass. It's actually, this one's called an engineer's compass, but it's, it's pretty easy to use. You have, a, you have a compass, and then there's a little eyepiece here to magnify it if you, if you need to see something a little closer, a little more accuracy. And there's a, there's a uh, crosshair so that you can sight on something in the distance and get your, your bearing. Also tied to this is a piece of what has been termed parachute cord. And if you can see this, there's a series of knots tied into it. This is actually a two-step process. You get your bearing, and then you have to know how far you travel. That's by your pace. So for every knot, that's a hundred, that's a hundred feet or so many paces, so that you know how far you have gone. Okay, it's pretty basic. This is not much different than what navigation was in uh, the 14th century or the 15th century. It's changed today. I drove up here on a, using a GPS system in my car. I've used my cell phone for a map. But this is the basic. This is what you use without having uh, the global positioning system. As we talk about Navigation. The alternate title for this sermon today was actually getting our bearings. Either one fits. Charting our future or getting our bearings. As a church, we need to chart the future. Where are we headed with our church and education? As a church school, most schools, it's sad to say this, most schools plan one year in advance. How are we going to pay? Are we going to have enough enrollment? Are we going to be able to pay the conference's salaries? And it's a, in a sense, it's survival mode. There is no long-range plan where they're going to be in 10 years or five years or even two years. And that's sad. That is really sad. We have to have a general change of attitude in our churches which will affect our schools. We have to have a change of the value of education. If you turn to Daniel 1, part of our scripture reading today, we're going to walk through this. I'm reading Daniel 1. Uh, We read verse 4. I'm going to do a little more than that, but then I'm going to talk about it. So just bear with me a second. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off 
to the temple of his God in Babylon and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of the court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach, teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine, or he assigned them, they were assigned, I have bifocal spokes, so sometimes I mess. Um, they, uh, let's see, the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Okay, let's talk a little bit about this passage and what's going on. The third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, we have Judah being besieged by Nebuchadnezzar. In a besiegement, Nebuchadnezzar, or whatever the powers, it could be Egypt, it could be Rome, it could be Greece, come to the area, they surround the city, and they say, pay us tribute and we'll leave you alone. In other words, they want some money, they want some taxes, they want something. Jehoiakim either couldn't pay it or wouldn't pay it, so Nebuchadnezzar besieged, continued the besiegement until he starved him out, and Jehoiakim said, okay, you win take us. And with that, there was not a slaughter. With that, Jehoiakim was taken into exile along with, think about this, the nobility and the aristocrats. You keep your enemies close. That's the thought here. All right. We're in chapter 3. He then ordered Ashpenaz to uh, select certain ones for training. We need to think about what's happening. What they want to do, what Nebuchadnezzar's goal is, is to take and retrain the uh, Israelites so they fit within the Babylonian society, so that they, they are loyal to Babylon. Okay? They went so far as to provide them food, provide them Babylonian education, and provide them with um, different names. They wanted them to assimilate into their society. When I first became an Adventist, I have not been a lifelong Adventist. When I first became an Adventist, I told one of my relatives about joining the church, and my family, although they're not They're respectful of religion. They are not very good Christians. I'll be the first to tell you that. But my relative said to me, as I described the Seventh-day Adventist church, he said, everybody's marching one way, and this church decides to face 180 degrees opposite. Something's wrong with this picture. Now you think about this with, with these Israelite children. What are they being told? All right, we know about Daniel's stand. We know what happened. We we have the stories in Daniel about uh, the fiery furnace and reading the vision or the, the interpreting the visions and the lion's den. We need to think about the Jewish education system a minute. In that time period, there were three levels of Jewish education. Understand, there was not a separation of church and state. It was a theocracy. The church, the leadership of the country, was led by the Jewish priests or the high priests or whatever you want to call it, or the king or however you want to tie it together, but it was all one. And there were three levels of education. First level, everybody went through. There was a, it was where they learned the, um, 
the scriptures they had them memorized and at the end of that period of time kind of like the end of our elementary school or maybe our high school they were given a test and how much of this do you remember how much of this can you recite and if you did real well you moved to the next level that second level was the level where they actually uh, studied it in depth they debated different points of the law and they gave interpretation And then the third level was the level of high leadership, the prophets, the priests. The interesting thing about this is the group, the second level, is what went to Babylon, the nobility and the aristocracy. The first level, typically if they don't make it into the second level, were sent back to be the, the carpenters, the fishermen, the farmers, they did the vocational type stuff. So here we have three different groups. Second group is taken, third group, the third group, the leaders are obviously in exile. Why would Nebuchadnezzar want that second group? Obviously because they're the brightest and the best and they will have the most effect on on, uh, Israeli leadership. Here's a key point. What level did Jesus call from? If, they, if, a, if a third level called for a, a student to follow them, they called from the first level to the second level, from the leadership to the second level, the nobility, aristocracy, the educated ones. Jesus didn't call from that level. He called from that first level, from the common person. Okay, that was just a little tidbit for your information. In our own education system, in our own education system, we have a a unique situation. Up until about 1875, in our in a, in the Western world, college education boiled down to classes in leadership, okay, leadership or theology. After 1875, our world, our Western world, adopted a, a, uh, a template of the industrial nations utilizing what we, today we call career training or we call college, but it was actually vocation. So they would learn to be Doctors. They would learn to be lawyers. They would learn to be school teachers. That's vocation, folks. There was a change in leadership, or change, not change in leadership, change in how education was assembled in the 20th, late 19th and early 20th century. A shift towards industrial society and its needs. That's our system today. As we uh, think about this, why would we want to change our system? Why would, what's, our, what's the system of education for? If that system of education is for training people to be literate, to be good citizens, and to be productive, you have the state of Illinois' education system. Plain and simple. Literacy is important for a free society. Productivity is important for a free society. Okay, decision making is important for a free society. I have a couple short quotes here I'm going to read. They are from uh, my shameless plug, uh, Educating for Eternity. George Knight writes, one of the challenges that educators must face developing biblically-oriented curriculum in the 21st century is the diverse worldviews that permeate contemporary society, including that of postmodernism, which claims that there is no such thing as a genuine worldview anchored in reality, that all worldviews or grand narratives our human construction. He's absolutely right. He's absolutely right. 
if you look at the basis for every single piece of curriculum outside of church-based, it's based on the fact of, of social acceptance of everybody. That's fine. I can go along with that. Everybody does their own thing. Some of that's okay. But if you have a problem with some of that, or I shouldn't say problem, if you have moral convictions contrary to that, you're wrong. That I have a problem with. Okay. He continues. The teaching of any topic in an Adventist school must not be a modification of the approach used in non-Christian schools. So in other words, we're not the church version of the public school. It's rather a radical reorientation of that topic within the philosophical framework of Christianity. Ladies and gentlemen, that's called the integration of faith and learning. At the heart of Adventist education is the goal of empowering students to think and act reflectively of for themselves rather than just to respond to the work or the will of an authority figure. Self-control rather than externally imposed control. In a Christian approach to education, human beings must be brought to a place where they can make their own decisions and take responsibility for those choices without continually being coaxed, directed, and forced by powerful authority. Uh, That's page 110 and 111 of this particular book. If God is in the curriculum, how can we go wrong? Isaiah 53 states, that was part of our scripture reading, All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. The peace translates into satisfaction, satisfied with their lives. Ladies and gentlemen, how do we define success in our society? You took the words out of my mouth. Money. Absolutely. Absolutely by the size of their paycheck, by the size of their wallet, their bank account, how big a car they have, how big a house they have, how many, how, how much political power they might have. Now, once do you define success, at least in the public arena, with how Christ-like that person is, how humble that person is, I have, a, I have an expression for my wife. I might be the head of the family, but she's the neck that turns the head. She's a very humble person. I will tell you, I don't make a decision without her being involved, and quite frankly, I could not function without her there supporting me. Okay, those people that support are important. And we need to educate our children that way. That they need, that it is, the supportive roles are just as good as the glitzy rolls, you know. Having a humble income, living within your means, is far more, um, far more desirable than having all those payment books and all those, those toys. Okay, if we are cranking out kids in an industrial society... We're not an industrial society anymore, but it, the concept is if, you're, if we are training kids, making kids, making students, making graduates, what's the final result supposed to look like? What are their values? More important to the point, what will it look like in Gurney 10 years from now? I, I, I think... The Lord, Gurney, has a school. I thank the Lord that you are willing to support it the way you do. But you see what's happening. You understand looking to the future. Where will our church, corporate church, be in 10 years? 
Where will Gurney be in 10 years? Consider this. Every major movement in the 20th century started with youth. And I could go back farther, but let's start with just going back to World War II. There might be a few here that are old enough to remember that. There was something called the Hitler Youth. You come to Red China, there was the Red Guard. The Red Guard was a youth organization. If you uh, come into today, in, in, in this century, we're talking about the whole uh, wanting change within our own nation or the change within the world. That's youth-driven, folks. People like me, I'm not going to be doing this. They're the future. They are impressionable. They have lots of energy. They are easily trained. Here's the thing. Daniel had a strong background in, um, in the Jewish culture, Jewish education, Israeli education. He was one of probably hundreds, if not thousands, of people that were moved to Babylon. We know of four or five that stood their ground to Babylonian re-education. How many didn't? Okay, Daniel's an exception. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay. How many of our youth can resist modern-day Babylonian education? Ellen White writes in the book of Education, chapter 7, True education does not ignore the value of scientific knowledge or literary requirements, but above information it values power, above power, goodness, above intellectual requirements, character. I emphasize character. The world does not so much need men of great intellect as it as of noble character. It needs men who, in whom ability is controlled by a steadfast principle. In Christian education, we prepare them for success. We prepare them to go and have a productive life. We prepare them to be good citizens. We prepare them to be good Christians. We prepare the next generation of leaders for our church and for our country. So how do we define success as a, as a church, as a congregation? How do you define success? That's a rhetorical question. I'm not, I'm not asking for any answer. So as we look to the future, as we Check our compass. I'm going to leave you with this one little caveat. There's a a couple points in history. I'm a history teacher by trade, by the way. Uh, There's there's uh, two instances in history of of excellent navigation that I'm going to relate. There are many of them. One was Christopher Columbus. Uh, He actually knew where he was, but if you look at his journal, you'll see him going in circles. There's a political reason why for that. But there's a, you come forward about 450 years. 90 years ago, this, last, this coming May, a gentleman by the name of Charles Lindbergh took off in the spirit of St. Louis and flew to Paris. His sole point of navigation was a speed estimate and a compass. It was a, uh, you know, it was a little more finer tool than this but it was a compass nevertheless. He was over open water at night for for most of it being 3,000 miles, and he came within a mile of where he was expected to be. Ladies and gentlemen, I, in in this sanctuary, I was here for a school board meeting last Tuesday night. I come into the sanctuary, and I took my compass, actually it's my phone compass, I have a compass on my phone, and I did the calculation of if it, what if he was off one degree. If he was off one degree over that distance, he would have missed it by 138 miles. There's one other piece. He was trained 
because he knew that if for every hour of flight, true north wasn't north. True north was magne or magnetic north and true north are two different spots. So he knew that as he flew and at his rate of speed, he had to adjust his compass reading by 10 degrees every hour. So where he, if he started at whatever it might be, let's say 90 degrees, 30 hours later, he was 300 degrees around the compass. But he knew he was trained to do that. He had proper training. As we chart the future, folks, our, our children need proper training. Our children need proper training in, in being good Christians and good stewards of, of, of uh, the Lord's money and the Lord's resources. So, we seek success for our children. We seek graduates in God's image. We seek graduates that will provide our church a future. And I, and I leave you with, with this final thought. Where will we be in 10 years? Thank you. Okay, I might not be lifting up a trumpet, I'm lifting up a grandchild, but he decided to sing with me. So, let's turn in our hymnals to number 213, Jesus is coming again. You can count on it. It will happen. Where will your heart be and where will your compass be pointing? Stand with me as we sing number 213. Father, we ask blessings on this church for their upcoming week. We ask blessings on the, the balance of this Sabbath day. Be with this congregation as they go forth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>